the way you pack away a container, the way you dry a container with a paper towel before you put stuff in it, the way you cut your labels straight or put them on straight in the container. You know, if you have respect for everything you do, the way you wash dishes and say hi to someone in the morning, you know, it all sort of adds up. We love traveling on dirty linen even in person, but sometimes on the podcast. And today we are heading over to New Zealand to speak to Tommy Hope. Tommy is a chef that I met when he was working at Attica in Melbourne, but he's gone back home. Tommy, welcome to Dirty Linen. Thanks, how's it going? Yeah, it's really good. And I'm really thrilled to have you on the show. Been following your career for a while. And although I was happy for you that you were going home to New Zealand, I thought that was a, that was a loss to Australia. Uh, tell us about where you've ended up and uh, what you're up to now. Um, yeah, so I, I came back in June this last year, actually. And um, yeah, it landed at the French Cafe, which is uh, yeah very much an established restaurant. It's been around probably for about three decades now. Um, it's changed hands to uh, Sid and Chan Sarawat, my current boss, um, who also own a couple of other restaurants in the city, uh, one called Coal, K-O-L, and the other Cassia. Um, but yeah, they've also been around in the industry for years in New Zealand. Um, they used to own a restaurant called Sid Art. Um, but yeah, just really good people as well, which is really important. Yeah, so interesting. I mean, for people who haven't been to the French Cafe, and I actually have been lucky enough to dine there, tell, tell us, you know, why it's such an icon. What has it meant for the city? What do people think about when they think about the French Cafe in Auckland? Yeah, I guess it's, um, well, yeah, one of the things which I love about it and also when I'm kind of trying to change about it is, um, it is it is sort of an iconic place. It is like classic fine dining in New Zealand. You know, everybody in New Zealand knows about the French Cafe. Um, and we're, you know, Sid taking taking over three years ago. He's very much um, a forward thinker, even though he's been in the industry for years. He's, you know, always trying new different things and shaking it up. Um, but yeah, it's uh, so it, it's currently it's about an eighty seater. We also have a private dining room in the back, and then a cellar, which I'm currently sitting in, which seats about twelve people. But um, it does have the classic sort of six, seven course degustation feel. Um, but yeah, I, I'm kind of bringing a, a little bit of a uh, rock star kind of uh, feel, which I kind of picked up at Attica, where you can sort of achieve fine dining, but it doesn't have to be stuffy and, you know, it doesn't have to be the, the norm of fine dining. Um, yeah, and that's, that's been fun. I've sort of, I've had free reign ever since I, I jumped in the position and um, full backing from Sid. Um, so yeah, it's been great. That's so interesting. I mean, I mean, I mean, and Sid has renamed it, so it's Sid at the French Cafe. So instantly, before you even get to the iconic bit of the name, you've already got this sense that something new is happening, which I think is really smart. Um, and yeah, that's such an interest. So interesting to hear you talk about what you've brought from that whole Attica vibe. And I suppose that's something that we can look forward to to seeing and and thinking about and experiencing in years to come as you know, chefs come, you know, spend time in uh, such an important restaurant as Attica and then, you know, interpret it, put their twist on it, you know, d discover what it means to them through their own restaurants. I mean, what, t like, I suppose, explain for us what it, what it was like for you to work at Attica and what the ex what the experience was like from your point of view and then what you can do with it. Um, well, yeah, Etika was it started off. I was heavy in the weeds on on lard when I first got there. You know, jumping in and eighteen courses or so, and um, you know, you're busy, busy. Um, but the levels always up, and then slowly progressing into after about a year of sort of understanding. You know, it always takes about a year to understand the the chef's sort of what he's trying to go for and what the restaurant is about. Um, I was comfortable enough to run a section. I could go into other things and started you know development, and then really got heavily into research. Um, and I found it like incredible, the whole, but very, Attica is very much um, like a Willy Wonka of Australia, like finding new products and ingredients that have never been used before. And I um, I started jumping on Google and I was reading about the history of Australia and, you know, all these in, indigenous ingredients and 50% of them weren't even being used. So, I, you know, I started trying to find them and I was approaching small councils in Western Australia to see if they had access to the small blue Kwandong or whatever, you know. Um, but yeah, that research and development was great. Um, did lots of travels around the world. Um, was Ben and, and other chefs. We went to Sydney, went back to New Zealand a couple of times. Uh, went to Germany one year and did a cooking demonstration on stage for a, a chef um, 
uh, a chef thing. Um, but yeah, it, it was uh, it was great. The the thing I took most out of Attica, I guess, was or one is um, treating people properly. Um, you know, the culture has to be respectable, and you know, everyone has an idea, and um, you come to work, and you know, you treat everyone with respect, and as well as that, um, just the standards, like keeping keeping everything to the ultimate standard and every single detail accumulated where it makes like a good restaurant an incredible restaurant, um, you know, down to the folding of napkins or how you set up your section or, you know, changing a spoon water, water every 10 minutes. Every small incredible detail will make a great restaurant. So and I, I try and carry that on, you know, everywhere I go. Um, yeah, and bring it to my team as well here at the French Cafe. Yeah, so interesting. I mean, it, yeah, there's so much in what you've just said uh, that I'd love to dig into, but we probably shouldn't talk for five hours. Um, from a development point of view with dishes at Attica, is, is there a dish that you sort of had a hand in right along the way that you were really proud of? Um, yeah, yeah, there's a few. I guess um, towards the end of my sort of stand at Attica, I really gained the confidence to, you know, jump in and, and feel competent in plating. Um, like when you first get to Attica, you, sit, you know, you're – kind of blown away and starstruck working with Ben. And then, you know, after a little while, you sort of break those boundaries and you realise he's, you know, just a really good person, you you would know. Um, and then, yeah, you saw, I gained confidence to create things, a couple of dishes. Uh, yeah, I I put the crocodile ribs on the menu, which I think is still on the menu in some aspect. Um, I One sort of my achievements in research was like finding the honey ants that we, um, I think they're still on the menu, serving them live. So a little ant... Um, down in Western Australia that has a honey sack um, and it's each ant is a different flavour so um, they're all unique um, but yeah we I originally started contacting councils and small tour groups and I stumbled across a guy who shows people around the desert and he is now digging up honey ants and serving them um, and sending them to us in, uh, at Attica and yeah it was great. Wow that's so amazing um yeah, that crocodile rib dish was a bit of a revelation. So I didn't realise that that was your handiwork. I mean, what do you what do you need to do to make crocodile ribs delicious? Well, we we first kind of got them and we failed a lot, which is you know important. But um, we we ended up brining them overnight and then we'd cook them again overnight in a water bath, and then we'd grill them to order over the the charcoal and brush them with a, a sour honey, um, native honey spice with uh, native spices. And then I think at the time, I think that was it. And we 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 put this big old ugly you know crocodile rib on a plate in the middle of the table at Annika and it was really good. You know, it's not something you'd expect, but um, we put uh, a couple of gnarly knives and told the guests to just dig in and eat with their fingers. And it was, you know, it's that sort of like shake it up attitude in a restaurant like Attica, you know, when it was 20th or something in the world at that point, um, which was really fun. You know, you can do this sort of stuff and it's just you don't really care about expectations of what fine dining should be. You know, it's crazy delicious. It's, it's a cool ingredient and it's... Um, and it's native to Australia, you know, it's like a ticked all the boxes. So, yeah, yeah, very cool. I mean, talk to us more about failure and how you deal with that when you're developing a dish. Yeah, like I still I still kind of get frustrated with myself. You know, you have an idea and then you, you try it out and it fails and you sort of question, oh, you know, am I doing it wrong? What, you know, what's going on? But then, you know, you always kind of forget that you try and try and try again and you will nail it. And it's the importance of just like trying something every day. Um, Attica, I was always encouraged, you know, you know, stop thinking about your own section, think about the bigger picture, like always try and find time in your day to to try something, even if you try something and it fails every day. You know, um, I think honestly, I've learned everything in my career from doing it wrong one time and, and seeing how it was done wrong. Um, so, so, yeah, it's important. It's very important to fail. If you don't fail, you don't understand uh, why things fail and then possibly how to correct them, how to fix them in a, in a pickle, you know? So Yeah, true. That's such a good point because um, I suppose people think that they're perhaps saving time by shortcutting or doing something safe, but then, yeah, perhaps that experience of failure is going to get you out of a hole one day. Yeah, exactly. You know, try different flavour combinations, um, which is something that we're doing here a lot at, at French Cafe. So it's like sort of sideways thinking out of the box, you know, like 
I guess cumin and chocolate, you know, weird. We're currently doing a dish with banana, coriander, and blueberries. And it's like, those sound super weird, but when you eat them, it's like really, it's actually pretty good. So um, flavor hunting, you know, was, it's, it's really cool. How do you even start to put banana and coriander together? Uh, well, we're doing, we're doing a little banana ice cream infused with cardamom and then, um, you know, we've also failed that by by finding out if you mash the banana with the, the milk, it gets stringy and horrible texture. So, you know, we just set, steep it in the milk and then strain it. Um, we serve that with some blueberries dressed with elderflower vinegar and coriander oil, um, white chocolate meringue shards uh, and a little chocolate chantilly. Like it's, it's super weird, but you eat it and it's just it's quite great. And is it a hard sell to, you know, the owners of the restaurant and then, of course, to the, to the diners? I mean, do you do you feel like you have to attract the right sort of diner or, or is it just all in the service of deliciousness? Yeah, I think ultimately, like, I've found after being here for a few months that there is definitely a French cafe diner, um, a classic guest, and, that you know, that there's nothing bad about that, but we... I'm not sort of holding back in how I push things. I'm trying to shake it up. Like even one thing I noticed a while ago, a lot of people here tend to eat bread with a knife and fork and I'm trying to like merge out of that. Like when you're at home, you wouldn't eat bread with a knife and fork. Whereas you see, you know, you see his guest tuck in and it's, um, we're almost thinking about taking the cutlery away. So, you know, I, t- I tell, I drop the bread, we pull this little comp de custard all over it and I tell them to rip it apart with their hands and lick their fingers, you know, you always get a giggle. Um, but yeah, small, small tweaks. Um, but then you also get the new, uh, the new guests that come in and a little bit younger crowd and more adventurous. And, um, we have a, we have a dish on at the moment is another dessert, which is a uh, Parmesan ice cream and then a uh, pear sorbet, a little walnut caramel and raspberries. And it's, it's super weird. It's almost like a little cheese course on a plate, but it's, um, it's hit and miss. Yeah. Some people like it, but like I said, it's, it's good to sort of, uh, not restrict yourself to like safe dishes and you know we're still keeping the level up the, te- the technique is still there and um, the quality is still there but it's just interesting flavor combos and I think I, I like to eat out places like that you know a bit more um, you know risky. This episode is proudly supported by Montague handpicked for you. So the eating experience of our plums is sweet. That's a primary driver. It's got to be sweet, but it's also got to have enough acid because the mix of acid and sugar is what is what gives fruit its flavour. And in a plum, it tends to be slightly higher acidity. And then um, a really nice, full, not dry, but juicy um, explosion of juice into your mouth as you as you bite into it. That's that's Nirvana for us in terms of plum. For more information, go to montague.com.au. Well, before you were at Attica, you were at Town Mouse, which was a really important restaurant in Melbourne. And I, I do detect a pattern for you working with uh, fellow New Zealanders, um, Dave Verhull and, and Christian McCabe there um, and, and the rest of the crew and, of course, Ben Shuri um, coming from New Zealand. Um, but tell us about your time at Town Mouse. What was that experience like? Uh, that was great. That was incredible. That was um, So I first landed in Melbourne. I, I had never heard of the Town Mouse, to be honest. I got here and I... I did a bit of a Google search, top restaurants, and just scanned through the photos and, you know, spent a day doing that. And I, I actually applied to Estelle, Estelle Bistro, and I checked in and I had an um, interview with Dave. And I was actually incredibly hungover when I had that interview with Dave. So it's a good thing he hired me. Um, but, um, yeah, it was great. It was uh, um, game-changing for me. Um, yeah, Dave and then Jasper Avent, who was, who was the head chef there at the time as well, while Dave was starting up Embla. Um, but yeah, Dave's, Dave's super sideways thinking. Um, I've definitely got a bit of, um, my style, I guess, from him and Jasper in a way of, you know, not doing the norm. He used to, Dave used to grab, you know, a bit of coconut and just walk around the kitchen eating it with, you know, a bit of rosemary or a bit of apple or something and, you know, go into the cool room and just nibble on stuff in the cool room just to see if the flavor combo worked. That is so cool. (laughs) Yeah. He's not, yeah, I've definitely got a. You know, I've got a good friendship with Dave as well. I've um, got a bit of uh, you know, love for him. But, um, yeah, very sideways thinking. And that I brought that on with me. And then working at Attica, you know, Ben's incredibly ingenious. Like, he's always sideways thinking. But 
in a different way. Like he's got a, yeah, very kooky people, but you know, the, the, the geniuses, yeah. So. Um, you remind me of um, an interview I did with Ben years and years ago where he talked about when he was a little kid um, taking a carrot and a piece of cheese to bed and nibbling them under the blanket and just enjoying the flavour combination. You just think, wow, this stuff really can go back a while. Yeah, yeah. Me and my twin, my, I've got a twin brother who's in America at the moment. When we were younger, we used to do blindfold um, tastings would go into the kitchen and it'd blindfold me and I'd give me 10 things to taste and, you know, five of them would be horrible, weird things in the kitchen. But, um, yeah, you know, I've always kind of been drawn to that. Um, you know, when I was when I was younger, my favourite subject in school was food tech. Um, and, yeah, cooking is the only job I've ever done, to be honest, apart from painting a fence for a few months. <laughs> um so, I mean, is was it that simple? Like you just, you, you wanted to be a chef and off you went? Kind of. I, I got into it. I was a kitchen hand at a cafe, um, which doesn't exist anymore, um, Escape Cafe. Um, and then I, yeah, jumped in the kitchen because I was short, started as a pastry chef. And I, I kind of liked, I liked the lifestyle. I was a very rock star, you know. My head chef was a DJ. Um, <laughs> we used to party after work and I, I kind of got into that and I just finished school. Um, and then, yeah, like, Years and years later, I did a diploma at AUT a couple of years, and then I've just kind of got into the the flow of, of loving it so much and also doing it for so long that I don't know what else to do. I've kind of considered getting out of it, but, um, yeah, that's just that's what I'm great at, you know, or hopefully great at, you know. You know. Yeah. I mean, what would what about it has made you think about getting out of it and then, on the other hand, why haven't you? I guess the yeah the the lifestyle of chef of cooking is definitely changing over the years. You know the four day work week is coming in. Um, work life balance is definitely more important um, everywhere. Even though you know some places may not be achieved, but um, it's yeah you know when you're younger and you just give it your all and you work ninety hour weeks and it's tiring and you um, you're being drilled because you don't you don't understand it yet. You know you when you're younger you're a young chef. You make the most mistakes and you you take it personally. Um, whereas now, you know, you know someone yells at you, they're just telling you why it's wrong, you know, don't take it personally. So, And it, it is hard when you're younger, you know. But I guess it's also a thing of when you when you get older, you know, are you going to be able to be a chef when you're 50, 60? Will you have to own your own restaurant? You know, do you have to do something still in the industry but not so, like, demanding physically. Yeah, longevity is certainly a real issue Um, because, yeah, not everybody wants to own a restaurant, but then at the same time perhaps your knees don't want to be in kitchens for decade after decade. Exactly, yeah, my knees definitely feel like they're 50. (laughs) Yeah, so, yeah, really, really interesting. Well, I wonder... I wonder what will happen. Um, Tommy, after you uh, were at Attica, you had your own kitchen at Bar Time, a wine bar in the western suburbs of Melbourne, definitely a change of pace. Tell us about making that move and what that was like. Um, yeah, so that was that was a really, really great point in my career. I guess I, I'd done my stint at Attica and I've, you know, topped the game as much as I wanted to there and I kind of achieved that goal. I had that goal a few years before I moved to Melbourne to work at Attica and I'd not so much like being in someone's shadow because it wasn't really like that ad or, or the town mouse, but, uh, you know, trying my own style, um, being responsible and I guess, yeah, finding my own style, which I managed to do as a, you know, a couple of months of failures and, um, at bar time, but, um, yeah, it turned really great. We had a really great team, just a couple of chefs, one young guy as an apprentice, another guy, um, Brendan, who used to work at Hides for a couple, a little while. Um, but yeah, it was it was good. It was definitely different to Attica, um, kind of similar vibe to the Town Mouse, I guess, like a small wine bar, natural wine, and just fun sharing plates. But um, yeah, I, I kind of I brought that standard from Attica, and I kind of I guess found a style that was delicious, but um, more importantly, I wanted to make dishes that sort of ate really well. Um, I was whenever I create a dish, I kind of I want it to be interesting and flavorful and delicious, but not overly complicated plating that it's just um, gimmicky. I guess you know it needs to eat well. I like dishes you can eat completely with one you know utensil, just a spoon or something. Um, 
but yeah, no, it, it was good. Really good team at Bar Time. Um, did my year there. Um, but yeah, we kind of clear, no, cleared my partner. I've been with for about 10 years as of next week, actually. Um, we, we got engaged at the start of the pandemic and then we kind of had this idea to move back to New Zealand, but obviously couldn't for a couple of years. So towards the end of Bar Time, we, we were at, we were sure at Hooker Falls, I think, or some sort of spa retreat. Um, quite tipsy and then end up just buying a ticket for a couple of months later. Um, we were kind of, we were kind of plateauing a little bit, you know, towards the end of the pandemic and you can't do anything. We didn't really want to get involved in huge projects because we knew if we started it, we'd just be ending it. So, um, but you know, it's been really great coming back, um, reconnecting with family, her family, my family, um, who still live here. Yeah. And what's the restaurant scene like in Auckland? Uh, it's, it's, I thought about that. It's kind of similar to Australia. I've only been back a few months. So I haven't really ventured out too much, but, um, um, it's a little hit and miss, but there's, there are some gems. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of, when I left Australia, there was a big sort of wine bar culture starting up kind of off the back of Embler and everything, which has trickled back here a bit. You, there's a couple of cool wine bars, um, but honestly, I haven't. I've spent a lot of money getting back, so I haven't eaten out too much while I was here. I'd love you to talk about taking those lessons or those sort of protocols from Attica about you know excellence and consistency and things. Uh, yeah, just um, creativity as well. But how do you apply it in another setting? Let's say a wine bar or um, or you know in another country. Like, how can you? How do you take those um, those lessons but apply them in a setting where perhaps the spend is lower or there aren't as many hands in the kitchen? Like what is transferable and what isn't? Yeah, I guess it comes down to um, – Attica is a great restaurant, but, it, you know, it's a, a very much a, a beast of a restaurant. It's got um, limited food costs, you know, the, the sky's the limit on, you know, sourcing ingredients from everywhere, you have to sort of restrict yourself back to, it. Um, you know, I, I was heavily more involved in food costs at bar time. You sort of understand that, we, you know, we don't have the money for this or that. I was bringing a lot of my own equipment from home that I was using in my pop-ups to the restaurant because um, it was easier than convincing my boss to buy one. Um, but it was... Um, you, you have to sort of achieve your team. Like I worked with an apprentice, it was me and one apprentice who had been cooking for about six months and I was trying to hand over these really complex sort of prep jobs and I sort of realised, look, he's only, you know, he's only so qualified. So I had to re- rein it in a bit um, while still keeping the standard. And I guess keeping the standard is like what you've learned in your career, you you don't cut corners. You don't, if you know a certain way that something needs to be done or um, to be to be right, you do it that way. You don't sort of cut corners just to make it easier or quicker. Um, and that sort of translates from Attica where you've got lots of, you know, lots of chefs working there and it's easy to do this. To, but, um, yeah, I guess it just comes down to cutting corners. Yeah, and I try and say that to my team here. I said that this morning in the briefing. Yeah, so it's like, I guess, scaling back the extent of some of the dishes or the complexity perhaps, but then the the sort of ethics that underpin them can be, uh, yeah, can be applied in any setting. Yeah. Yeah. Just standards. Yeah. And details, little details as well, you know, the way you pack away a container, the way you dry a container with a paper towel before you put stuff in it the way you cut your labels straight or put them on straight on the container. You know, if you have respect for everything you do, the way you wash dishes and say hi to someone in the morning, you know, it all sort of adds up. Yeah. Really beautiful. I feel like there's, this, there's going to be, people are going to take so much from what you're saying, Tommy. It's, um, yeah, really actionable and, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty deep really. It's great. It's like how you treat people and, and, the, and the things around you, uh, yeah, it really matters. Yeah. Well, yeah, I feel like we've just discovered the meaning of life almost. <laughs> So let's leave it there. But Tommy, um, thank you so much for chatting to us today. Um, really appreciate your insights and um, yeah, love, love. I will just so much love watching your career and seeing what you do next. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for all your support along the way as well. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. 
We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This is a Deep in the Weeds production.